Maggie, it's Debbie. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing, Debbie? I'm so excited to speak with you after watching these first <laughs> five episodes. It's like, oh. I need more. I need more now. <laughs> oh, that's really nice to hear. That's really nice to hear. Maggie, this is a phenomenal series. I was following this because it was nationwide news back when all of this went down in the early 2000s. And even up through when the conviction was overturned and he entered the Alton plea, yep. it's, it's not that often that that's done and done so publicly, but it was. And to see, and I've seen the documentary series, but to yeah. see what you and Antonio have put together here, wow. This is a perspective we don't normally get to see. Instead of honing in on the nuts and bolts of the, of the legal process and the trial, you're showing the human collateral damage. Yes, yes. We wanted, um, we wanted to show as much, you know, this is a show, you know, it's a, it's, it's a bit of a thriller, it's a bit of a mystery, but we also wanted to create a family drama and also, you know, show what happens when there's an absence of a family member. Like, not only is Kathleen Pearson part of the tragedy, but she's also part of this family. And when she disappears, what does that look like? Mm -hmm. um, and so it was really interesting to explore it from, you know, a pursuit of justice, but also just that dynamic of how, how do people experience trauma and what does grief look like in a family in conjunction with having a documentary being made about you mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, trying to figure out what, who, if anyone was responsible for that night. Um, but yeah, going back to, we, we, we decided uh, early on that it wasn't, it wasn't going to be about just, it wasn't a trial, you know, the show wasn't going to be about the trial. And, um, you know, as the writer, it's just like you had to figure out a way to show the main, you know, the main subject of the documentary is a bit, it's the family, but it's also the trial, but how to show that in a somewhat expeditious fashion. And we thought, well, what better way to do it than one of the themes of our show, which is the idea of storytelling and the, and, and the construction of stories, you know. And so we thought, let us use the making of the documentary and make that an episode and use that as the, you know, literary device that moves us through the trial in a way where we can highlight the key pieces of information or evidence, um, but also educate the viewer what it is to make a documentary. Mm -hmm. um, and which is, you know, also... What they're doing is also everyone's telling a story. You know, you have the defense telling a story. You have the prosecution telling a story. You have each of the family members, whether it's Kathy's sisters or the children telling their stories. And then you have a documentary team putting all those pieces together to create one big story. And then, of course, the, uh, the writers were looking at it and thinking, oh, <laughs> so then we take all those pieces and we make our story, um, which... Uh, yeah, it, you know, the, you know, condensing the, the trial into that one, the fourth episode, uh, it, it was a, it was, what, we're like, are we crazy? And, but it, I think it worked. <laughs> I hope it worked. I think you really hit the nail on the head by, con but with that condensation and putting it yeah. in one, because it doesn't, because if you had done the full blown trial, and drug it out over a couple episodes, it would have taken away from the dynamic that you were building with the individual yeah. puzzle pieces and the emotional fallout and what's happening. Because what you have structured here, every child, everybody really get, we really get to understand their perspective. And not only their perspectives, but what each one, the hidden secrets, everybody here has hidden secrets. And it's really interesting to watch that unfold and to see similarities between 
relatives develop. Yes. And yes. Bec it's because you spend time. And not just on the page, but then your, the cinematography carries through. And I know these aren't final finals that I'm looking at, but I have to say... Right. Um, what Lyle and Michael are doing as the cinematographers... Oh. Spectacular, especially yeah. the decision using so many ECUs. Typically, you know, you, yeah. ECUs can just overpower a film and totally detract. But here, it really puts you. There are some great ones of Colin, incredible yeah. ECUs yeah. of Colin. And the way he is, his facial expressiveness, this is a Colin Firth we've never seen before. We're talking in we're talking right. in Emmy nomination here for Colin Firth for this yeah. performance, but these ECUs yeah, really I mean, hone in, and we feel like we are getting under his skin, which is like creepy crawly to begin with, as we're yeah. watching his eyes and the attitude, uh, especially episode two. You don't see the remorse. You don't see any remorse. And then episode three, it's all about me. It's all about me. Until this is over, it's all about me. And you <laughs> see that play out in every episode. You build to that, that the world revolves around him. In his mind, the world is about him and nobody else. Yeah. I mean, I think with the extreme close-ups, as you are mentioning, it's um, what I, I think typically what a viewer expects from them is, you know, a bit of certainty. And because mm -hmm. it is so close, right? Like, this is the thing. You mm -hmm. know, you know, it's the thing. It's the only thing in frame. But what these extreme close-ups were doing were showing you exactly what you don't know. That's it. You see the man, but you don't have any idea what he's thinking. And so yeah, it, was, it, was, it was great. And just to... The cinematography was fantastic, you know, and you're, you're watching it on screen, but... Um, watching it unfold, you know, day after day on set, we, you know, these were very ambitious scripts. Yeah. Um, we had three timelines, which means makeup changes, wardrobe changes that have to define a certain time period. Um, and, you know, when you're doing that, there's no, there's not, there's no time. You have a certain amount of hours every day to work, a certain amount of day per episode to produce an episode of TV, and it, we had, you know, the cinematographers, they were <laughs> working very quickly and artistically under extreme circumstances. <laughs> so not only are they incredibly talented, but they had to do it, uh, you know, no one produces anything under ideal conditions, but I, I, my hat is off to them for, you know, being able to create and produce what they did given the circumstances. And that, that extends to all of our department heads. Um, we had such a devoted team of people, you know, working in COVID as well in mm -hmm. Atlanta, you know, just all coming together. Um, so I'm glad, I'm glad that that stood out to you. It really does. And I also love the way that you have differ differentiated between what is happening in the real world and then what is being seen, the footage that we're looking at that the, that the documentary crew mm -hmm. is picking up, the video footage. So you've got that, you know, what we're so used to seeing on the news when you're shooting in courtrooms and, you know, when you're second generation down in the quality of, what, of what's coming out. Mm -hmm. That differential is so well executed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so we we used cameras, um, and and so when we were doing that, we you know we had to hire our our cameramen, our document quote unquote documentary cameramen and women um, that we used. You know, those are camera; those aren't act, they're actual camera. <laughs> they're part of the you know. That's, so we had casting calls for um, camera. We kept trying to get Lyle in it, and kept refusing, um, but. <laughs> But so, but that was part of it, you know. It it's, it's a very organic, holistic, you know. It's cameramen playing cameramen, mm -hmm. um, women, and so it it it, it showed. And um, having all that footage, you know, I, you know, my hat's off to Shelby, the editor of One Hundred and Four, who had to go through 
not only our, you know, our cameras footage, but also, you know, we had, the, you know, off, most television, you do have these multi-camera setups. Right. We were having, like, multi-multi-camera setups. You know, we weren't using our expensive camera package necessarily, but we had multiple documentary cameras, like, shooting at the same time. Um, you know, and, and also, too, you know, uh, our set designer and uh, production designer, Michael Shaw, he's, like, created this beautiful thing that enabled us to to do all that but in a fashion that felt you know it felt very organic it didn't feel forced well hopefully it didn't feel forced um but the courtroom scenes i remember the actors were sitting there they're like you know because they want to know you know where like my eye like what where's the camera like what am i explaining to you know what you know and we're like oh they're everywhere Mm -hmm. (laughs) this is a this is a courtroom, this is a set that we've built, and the cameras are literally everywhere. <laughs> and so just, just put the idea of cameras out of your head. <laughs> well, and that's um, just it, because it feels like they're not making eye contact with a camera. It's as in anybody who's ever been in a court, you know, your eyes are looking everywhere. Everywhere. Because the eyes of the world, quote unquote, are on you. So I love the fact that nobody was looking directly into a camera. Right. It really, yeah. it, it gave yeah, it, exactly. the authenticity factor is outstanding, Maggie. But, you know, this begs the question, with the editing process for these episodes, because you are jumping your timelines. Mm-hmm. You know, we're going back, or, you know, we start in, in Christmas 2001, we go backwards to October, we go fast fast forward to 2017, we've got a 2002 yep. expert walk, you're going back and forth, but it's very cohesive, it is not confusing, but maintaining that pace when you're jumping from year to year, decade to decade, is difficult. How challenging yeah. has this editing process been? Because you don't have a single episode that's just one timeline. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think there's only one episode where there's just two timelines, and that's uh, the fifth episode. Um, honestly, it started with um, it started with the writing process, and um, you know, I you know, we come into the room and I said, having done stuff like this before, uh, it, it, it doesn't sound very sexy, but. Um, you have to come up with rules because when you get in the weeds, you have to have something to fall back on. And so we came up with rules of our timelines. And one of the rules was we wanted almost, if you remove the time frame from each of the timelines, that the story would still work. Mm-hmm. That you could just read the script and that, of course, you know, Kathleen being alive and Kathleen not, no longer being with us, you know, obviously there would be a, a spatial temporal leap there. But that the theme and that the, I kept saying the word, the energy, the, the energy of the scene has to lead into the next scene. Mm-hmm. And that energy either it has to be intentionally a, a contradiction or it has to be a continuation. And so it's almost like, does this script, if you remove the timelines, will it read like just any story? You know, with, again, like I mentioned, the, the obvious kind of things that would be jump out at you as like continuity errors. The other thing we did was, well, I did, because we were doing this over Zoom as well, which provided, you know, some obstacles, um, especially when you're doing something with multiple timelines, is you would just use different color cards. And so, like, my wall, like, my office is a (laughs) 360-degree murder board of eight episodes, and, like, it would be funny because I would be... Like, like walking around with my computer and pointing with my finger and talking and being like, you know, this is taking us to this, this is taking us to this, this is taking us to this, let's talk about this transition and work through it and make sure that, like, we can fall back on that rule of, like, energy and um, continuation. And then the other thing is what we, you know, what we came to discover at the end of the writing process was that the final episode, which could, which which is kind of the beauty of the right process is, or the, you know, the breaking the, the, the season is that we've discovered, oh my gosh, the final episode can happen within 24 hours in each of our different timelines. And so that was a really fun discovery because it felt a bit, um, you know, when you're, when you're creating something, you want like these little signs that you're doing it maybe 
right? And mm-hmm. that felt like such a good sign that all of our timelines, after we felt like we really nurtured them, led to that moment where they were all happening within 24 hours. Not the same 24 hours, obviously, but within 24 hours. Um, another one of the rules that we had with the timelines was once the timeline started, we have, you know, we have the past, the present, and the future. Those th- you never flash back within the I- within a timeline. Mm-hmm. You have to keep moving forward. And so each of our timelines, although you know you could you could consider them like quote unquote flashbacks, it's not really because they're, 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 the the stories are always just moving forward once, like we said, go. And essentially, what we're doing is the the past timeline takes us runs throughout the episode and takes us to nearly the very beginning of our present timeline, which is what we open the episode with. Mm-hmm. So it's actually a circle, <laughs> almost, nearly. It, but it works. <laughs> like everything so... in the staircase is nearly the thing, <laughs> but not quite the thing. <laughs> it works so well, Maggie. It really does. And the fact that... As you well know, so many filmmakers, so many producers, directors would have for these quote unquote flashback timelines will go and change up the visual tone, will throw a, a sepia wash in right. or right. alter the color composition. You didn't do that here. So everything feels it's no. it keeps moving forward. It's just it's on a train and that train keeps going. I made a decision not to make it not to make any like overt stylistic differences. Um between the timelines mm-hmm. other than one, which was the future timeline, which is pretty subtle, but we uh, minimized the use of handheld camera work throughout everything except for the beginning of the future timeline. And the idea was that we'd have handheld on the future to kind of give this connotation of, like, a little bit, we wanted it to feel a little surreal and not as grounded as the past and the present because we wanted to be like, what exactly is happening? But then the moment that Michael and David and Sophie walk through the door of the conference room at the courthouse, we re- returned to, you know, putting the camera on a tripod and, like, getting rid of the handheld to establish, oh, we're, oh, this is the reality. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was, and it was, it's a pretty small stylistic thing, but it's actually the absence of hand, a lot of handheld work throughout uh, the series that was very intentional, so that that would be highlighted within the future timeline at, that, at the beginning portion of it. Mm-hmm. I'm curious, what led you to this story to tell, and what did you draw from? Uh, you know, I know that there, the, there was Jean Javert's, his series, his documentary. Also, yes. Michael himself wrote his own book, a memoir about this. Yes, yes. So I'm curious, yes. what led you to this, and then what did you pull from to develop everything in here? Because you're true to the legal timeline. You're true to the right. media timeline. You're true to the individuals, but you dive into these individuals. So I'm curious about your process of putting this together from that perspective? Um, I mean, my, my whole, having written a lot of um, television that, you know, is, uh, well, true crime, but also just based on a non you know, it's based on nonfiction. What I've found is that when you're doing research, of which we did an enormous amount for the staircase outside of the documentary, we had um, Diane Fanning's book, uh, Written in Blood. We had interviews, um, you know, even going into Reddit forms just to get people's perception wow. of the thing, which was equally as important. Um, what I found when I do, uh, do research, um, we had an incredible researcher, Michael Matthews, um, and uh, uh, later on, Josh Bressler. Um, we... You have primary sources that have been vetted. They're, you know, they're legitimate sources. And what I found is you'll often have sources that contradict one another Mm -hmm. using the same facts. And that is the sweet spot. (laughs) And that's where all the creativity occurs. (laughs) Because what it really speaks to is that there is no way to know anything for sure. So we, you know, we use something like um, the blow poke or the staircase with, a, a certain pattern of blood spatter. And that 
thing exists and it's, you know, quote unquote, real and objective. But we show when you look at it from multiple perspectives, how your view of that thing changes. Mm -hmm. And it's not because the thing itself is changing or saying anything different. It's what you're bringing to it. Mm -hmm. It's your backstory. It's your bias. Um, And so for all of us, it was important in the writer's room to recognize we were all bringing our own baggage or not, you know, for lack of a better word, to this story. And to, to kind of, as opposed to avoid it, it was kind of not to necessarily celebrate it, but to recognize it. And that, that is a bit of what we're trying to do with it, is that justice is a story, um, you know, the true crime genre in this, in this desire to have a black and white answer or to, to, you know, to have someone be innocent or guilty or to know exactly what happened that night. We wanted to shine a light on the fact that that just is an, it's an impossibility and that perhaps we move closer to the truth by being slightly more circumspect and looking at our own subjectivity and what that is actually, how that informs the story. And that's a more honest way of viewing these things. So the research was incredibly important, but it almost was important in the way that um, in order to break the rules, you know, need to know what they are first. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it was important to know, you know, all these multiple perspectives, but also not necessarily feel, you know, boxed in by representing them. You know, the, when we spoke with the actors, we didn't cast actors that look like the characters. We casted actors that we know could embody elements of the characters that would make them recognizable, but not strict imitation. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was that, that was a role, you know, that that was a philosophy for casting, but that was a philosophy throughout the, the you know the production, whether it's you know set design or you know cinematography or wardrobe and makeup. Um, it was you know people would be like, does it need to be exact? And it's like, no, oh. but it needs to be something that we understand is there. And, you know, we do have, we did, you know, we had a, a you know, we did have a prosthetic body and we had the blood spatter trying. And that was actually the one thing that we ended up replicating to um, a T was the back staircase. Mm-hmm. We actually, our locations manager got us into 1810 Cedar. It happened to be for sale. Wow. Um, during pre-production, um, and so they were able to get in there and do, um, you know, measure the staircase, and then we were able to fabricate three different staircases. One was our clean staircase. One was our staircase that had the blood spatter, and then our green, or, you know, our green staircase for stunts. And so um, that was the only thing actually that ended up being exact. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I I have to compliment Michael's work on the production design, the set dress, and all, yeah. be, especially within the Peterson house, because mm-hmm. that it is apportioned so beautifully. And what I find interesting is that you have this veneer of how beautiful and perfect everything is, but at the same time, because of things like bats in the attic, which also could be kind of metaphoric for Michael may have some bats in his belfry, but you've got the bats and then you've got the water is not working. The shower nozzle isn't working. The, the tub, the tub faucet isn't working. So it's, you're setting us up with the idea of wealth is not, their wealth is not what it appears on the surface. We see that following through bail money, I don't know. Is there enough bail money? Oh, we may have to take a, a second on the house, and it go and you lay the you give us these breadcrumbs that keep feeding yeah. us and giving us a little more information that the Petersons are not who the world sees them as, especially right. Michael. It is yes. It is about the idea of facade and the idea of. Um, you know, a bit about what society expects from people, which then, you know, encourages the perception that one needs a facade. Um, And there were a lot of conversations with Michael and Edward, um, our set decorator, our initial conversations about, you know, again, how much do we want to replicate in the Peterson house? And then, 
you know, what, what are these important, what's important? And for us, for Antonio and myself, what, what was important was that idea that is kind of falling, it, it initially, which is, I think, I mean, I don't mean to generalize, but when you watch the documentary initially, you're like, oh, it's a beautiful house, it's family. But then when you watch the second time, you, you know, you start seeing a little bit like, like a little bit on frame right. You're like, wow, that's just a pile of like crap. Not, you know, just like random stuff. And then you begin to notice that their closets are kind of like stuffed with things like old computers and like too much clothing. And like, you begin to realize that like, there was so much more going on in this house and met the eye on initial glance. And that's what we communicated to Michael and Edward. We were just embodied that the idea that there's, you know, when you first glance, everything's fine. But just if you look for two more seconds, you begin to notice, wait, that's a little too much clutter or that's Mm -hmm. too much dust or to your point, like the shower is not working or, there's bats and they can't afford to get rid of them. And, you know, it, it, it was the idea that this, the house itself was beginning to fester. Yeah. <laughs> and that that was a problem. And that was their relationship kind of regardless of what you believe happened that night. That's one of, one of our things that, as writers and creators that we're saying, this is something we believe to be true, that what? this was a relationship there was tension and it was beginning to faster and people weren't dealing with the problems that they need to deal with, which is a lesson to us all really, which is, you mm-hmm. know, there's no time like the present <laughs> to, you know, air out your dirty laundry. So it was, it was that idea. And it was great having these conversations because we built that house. It's a two story house that we built. Oh, wow. And then of course, yeah. Um, on, in a, on a, a warehouse that we converted into a soundstage in Atlanta, which was just no small feat. Um, and so it's a two-story house. We built it. And of course, which is the movie magic of it all, we had to build that house with the specs of the exterior location that we had to find that wasn't <laughs> you know, in no way the, Pe- the actual Peterson home. So then you have to combine reality and fiction, create something, you know, to create that, that, that house. And so, you know, what's interesting is about in, you know, in the Peterson world, the pool is in the backyard. Well, at our house, our, it's in the front yard. <laughs> so it's, a whole, it's like, it's one of those things that you're on your location scout and you're like, this is great, but the pool's in the front yard. And Michael Shaw's like, this is how we do it. And, I mean, I mean, I, I believe I'm that is, like was the least of my concerns when we got into post production is whether or not people believe the pool was in the back of the house. So it's just yeah, they, they was such an incredible team with those two. Well, I have to say one of my favorite moments in the film is the unwrapping of Christmas presents and you, you've got and Caitlin sitting there and you've got this perfect little box. And she goes to unwrap it. Ann Klein box. You can tell it's an Ann Klein watch box. And she opens it, and the first thing she says, that's not the one I wanted. That right. sums up that family yes. and what does not matter to them, that they are so skewed in what is really valuable in life. That one scene and the look on her face was just fabulous. That's not the one I wanted. Yeah, Olivia. It, it just... Yeah. So it, it's interesting because in writing 102, um, I knew that in one of, in, in the seventh episode that we would then see Kathleen buying the watch and that we'd know why it wasn't the one. Oh, well, uh, now... Yeah, see, I now I have to wait for episode seven. Oh, my yeah, God. sorry. I just... As I was saying oh, that, I was like, Maggie. No. Maggie. <laughs> You're killing me. You're killing me here. I know. <laughs> I know. I'm sorry, but that's but that does speak to kind of the way that the the, the construction of the episode yeah. is these scenes and the way that we had to work with the actors was because you know they didn't necessarily they weren't you know they're in the moment they're not supposed to necessarily be thinking about what's going to be we're going to be producing down the pike yeah down the road 
So it's one of those things where I'm like, the reason that you are disappointed in this watch isn't necess- it isn't the watch that you wanted, but it's also a sign that something was going wrong mm-hmm. because your mom typically would have gotten you the watch that you wanted. Unlike my Unlike mother, who would have <laughs> purposely gotten the wrong one, you know, it's... <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Out of defiance. Now I can't wait for episode seven. I have to commend you on the casting, Maggie, because everybody, this is what, Dane DeHaan, I love seeing him in episode five and really stepping, stepping up. Patrick Schwarzenegger yep. is solid through it all. Michael Stolberg, another, just coming off of, of uh, Dope Sick, Wow, to see him here. <laughs> totally amazing. Yeah. Parker Posey is fabulous. Fabulous. Just, you put together an amazing cast. Right down to the, you know, the men in Blockbuster or the men in the room behind the adult section in Blockbuster. Right. There is so much thought and detail here. And it all just builds yeah. this world. And it is contrary to what Michael Peterson wants to tell, but it's what everybody else, when you put all the pieces together, that's what everything else is telling us. And it's really interesting, the multi-layered construct that you, ha- that you have here. That's good, because who are hoping it'd be interesting as opposed to just downright confusing. Um, no, it's... <laughs> so, but... And But I have to say, the icing on the cake, the scoring, and the theme, the theme music, I am in love with it. I think the theme is fabulous, but then the music through the rest is also just wonderful. The scoring is great, and the instrumentation that is used with the music, there are moments we get a lot of string tremolo, we get, you know, cellos happening, and that adds even more and punctuates the scene. Just, I really love it. Oh, good. Yeah, no, I mean, I think we realized, I mean, I think most people realize this with their shows, but um, fairly, it had to be holistic. Like, everything had to speak to to, to one another. So this, um, this idea that the, the, the music needed to feel kind of almost a bit steeped in tradition, Mm -hmm. yet progressive at the same time, Um, you know, and uh, it it was really fun to have the initial conversations with the composers and, you know, you know, the the title sequence designers and everyone and just in knowing the core themes and saying, you know, we're going to give you the, the theme, which in terms of music and title sequence is a bit of an abstract concept in terms of how you'll, uh, uh, you know, eventually execute your job. But for us, it was always important that, you know, every person that was creatively, you know, contributing creatively had some idea of like, this is what's going on. You know, give us, we're, we're open to it. Like, give us your ideas. Like, how do we express this theme through something like music or our title sequence? And, um, I think when you have um, such talent, you have to have talented people, um, but also just the ability to tell them that, like, you know, part of us, part of this process is you telling us what you think about it, mm-hmm. <laughs> as opposed to us just saying, "Here's the thing that we need. Can you, you know, do it, please?" Mm-hmm. Um, and so it, it was a very communicative, collaborative process when it came to everything. Um, and I think in, in a sense that does reflect itself in the cohesiveness that I think you're suggesting that you feel, um, which, you know, yeah. That, I mean, when you have multiple timelines, you want cohesion. Like yes. that's something you, you're angling for, because if you don't, people are just going to be all over the place. Well, you definitely have that. So one last question for you, Maggie, before I let you go. I'm curious, what is the appeal and fascination of true crime stories for you? Oh, yeah, for me? Well, I think, it, I, I think it's, it's a two-part answer. I think, I think I share with a lot of people the desire to find order and 
a, you know, a world that can feel chaotic, um, you know, to, to figure out a reason why entropy or accidents or tragedy occurs. And, you know, if I, if I can kind of understand that, you know, maybe it's less likely to happen to me, but also that, like, there's some sort of justice or some sort of explanation for the, the way life turns out. Um, but then my interest in exploring true crime is uh, the fact that I don't necessarily believe that that's possible. So I think in searching for that, you're looking for something, or I believe I'm looking for something that doesn't necessarily exist, and that with the staircase, there was an opportunity to show that not only to, to, to recognize that desire for order and control, to show that it doesn't necessarily, it's not necessarily, you can't necessarily achieve it or find it. And then ultimately, that there is ease with knowing that that's, that's okay, that, that those things in not accomplishing that, that life does go on, that we can still honor people like Kathleen Peterson and that 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 actually can be a you know a subset of the true crime genre is not necessarily solutions or you know justice or innocent or guilt but just knowing that there is no single truth Mm -hmm. um so (laughs) yeah that's that's why i'm that's why i'm interested in true crime oh well i'm so glad that you're making true crime i can't wait for more but right (laughs) now i can't wait so how many total episodes does the staircase have eight 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 episodes okay eight episodes yeah. oh my god i got three more i gotta wait for three more you're killing me but it will be well worth the wait to see them because i just think this is this is so well done maggie it is a riveting and spellbinding series the nuance the detail the authenticity of the story and this different perspective of the human collateral emotional collateral damage from one incident I just think it's it's yeah. just spectacular. I can't wait for more. Oh, thank you. Well, you'll have to let me know how it, how you feel about the ending. <laughs> I will. I will. Maggie, thank you so much. This has been a joy, and I hope we get to do it again. Me too. Me too. Thank you, Debbie. I Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.